through the book of Ruth, and we have come to uh, chapter 2 previously, and I've almost did some character studies in the middle of these uh, chapters here, and um, one with Naomi, one with Ruth, and now I want to look at Boaz uh, this morning, and just uh, the title of the sermon is Relationship Responsibilities, Relationship Responsibilities. I believe in Boaz we see a picture of course, of Jesus Christ, and we see a picture of a man who is a man that God is pleased with, and he uh, is in this relationship, and he behaves himself uh, like he ought to, and uh, boy, we live in a day in a culture that's just crazy when it comes to relationships. I mean, one day with this one, the next day with that one, and uh, no discernment, no discretion, no, I mean, just wide open, whatever. Whoever texts, whoever knocks, whoever, you know, uh, snaps, just who, whatever day it is, I'm good. Whoever it is. Can I tell you, you, you're in grave danger if that's the way you operate relationships. And uh, but we find a pattern here. And before we get into uh, chapter 2, I want to give you some some ways that, Ruth responded uh, to relationships the proper way, and uh, this is this is mainly uh, as far as the ladies is concerned. But um, the first thing that we see Ruth uh, that she did right, she was available but careful. She was available but careful. Um, I still believe, and I believe God's word teaches that the man ought to be the pursuer. She was available, but she was careful. She didn't go uh, pursuing Boaz. He found her. Amen. Amen. And so uh, I would say to anybody embarking on a relationship, um, gentlemen, don't expect her to pursue you. You be a man and pursue her. Now, now, you know, ah, that's just old-timey, okay. I'll give you that, but it is, I think it is a biblical pattern. And uh, lead. And, well, well, how will, you know, how will he notice me? Well, God, if you're the right one for him and he's the right one for you, God has a way of doing that. God, uh, God knows exactly. George Mueller said this, God is behind the scenes and he controls the scenes he is behind And God not only orders our steps, he orders our stops. And he does. And so, uh, available but careful. Um, Don't don't be desperate. Well, get quiet right there. Don't be desperate. That's not God's way. God's not desperate. He's not desperate and his children should not be desperate. Because God is a sustainer of those that love him and those that are called by his name. And that goes for any area. We don't have to be in desperation about a storm nor a relationship. Because God will take care of us. So uh, be available but not care, but, but careful, very careful. Number two, be responsive. She was responsive but she was pure. She was responsive but she was pure. Uh, she responded to Boaz, but she responded in a way that honored Christ. She didn't start going hanging all over him and wearing provocative clothing to get his attention and just laying, you know, all over him all the time. Well, we, I know it's Sunday morning, but we're okay with that? Right. This is a Baptist church, right? Okay. You, you know, flea fornication is a Bible doctrine. Bible principle, and so she wasn't hanging all over him, and uh, she was responsive, but pure, but pure. And uh, ladies, he ought to have to work to to get your attention. Uh, if you're not married, he ought not just you ought not just answer. Don't answer every text. Let a couple of them lay. Amen. That's great preaching. I'm going to tell you right now. If nobody else ought to say amen, you daddies ought to say something. Thank you. Um, Just let a couple of them lay. 
Don't be all, you know, waiting at attention all the time. Make him, what's he going to do when you get married? He's going to quit pursuing because he never pursued to begin with. But as a married man, I'm supposed to pursue my wife. And uh, so, you know, she was responsive, but she was pure. Don't let your guard down. And these boys will paint such a pitiful story themselves. And how, you know, how pitiful they are. And they just need you. You respond, but you be pure. You be pure. Number three, don't force a relationship. Don't force it. If ten out of, if nine out of ten people tell you he's a dud, can I tell you what he is? <laughs> but he's the only one that's been calling. Well, he's the only one that can stop calling. Change your number. Daddies, there's a lot of ways to do that. Amen. Don't force it. I've seen so many married people now, 15, 20 years down the road, and some of them not married anymore, but they were married because they forced something that wasn't the will of God. Don't force it. Well, I'm too, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm so far into this thing, I can't get out now. Yeah, you can. If you're not married, you can't. Amen. If you're single, you can still be, you can get out. Amen. Don't ever think there's not, you're, you're beyond getting out of a relationship. It's not God honor. You can get out of it. Don't force it. Don't force a relationship. And number four, God needs to be honored in every stage. In every stage of a relationship, God ought to be honored. There ought not be a day uh, in your relationship when Jesus Christ is left outside. And if he can't come inside, why not? If you put a do not disturb sign on your door, why, why are you not letting him in? It's because probably there's stuff going on that ought not be going on. If he can't be involved in it, if he can't be involved in your speech, your thought, your activity... And it's probably not a God-honoring relationship. If you can't invite the Lord, if you can't pray over what you're fixing to do, it's probably not right. If you can't say, Lord, bless what we're about to do, then probably not ought to do it. Amen. Amen. And, and I'm not talking about impure things. I'm just talking about maybe going places, doing things that God don't want you being, you know, the, the arrangement's not right, whatever. Then uh, if you can't invite the Lord in, it's probably not a good activity. No probably to it. It's, it's not. God ought to be honored in every stage of a relationship, and God will take care, take care of you through it. Uh, God took care of Naomi. He gave her a grandson. Amen. He gave her a grandson. Jesus Christ in grace can use anybody and he can give you exactly who it is God has for you. And that didn't cost anything and that was just the introductory remarks, all right? Now, how do how do satisfying or how do how do godly relationships begin in the real world. You know, we live, in a, we live in a world that says, you know, luck, fate, some arrangement of the, you know, check the horoscope, check the stars. Uh, oh, you just stumble in a relationship. Whoever catches the bouquet, that's who's getting married next. I hope not. Hmm. Um, you know, and, and then, then there's, you know, position yourself so that luck will, will strike. That's not, none of that stuff's biblical. And then you got, then you got people who will say, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's all in technique. You got to know how to manipulate. You got to know how to persuade. You got to know how to captivate somebody by saying exactly the right words. Can I tell you God has a different idea? God has somebody for you, and you don't have to manipulate God or the person. You don't have to check the stars. You don't have to depend on fate. Just depend on the Lord, and he'll bring the right person along and uh, depend on him. But I want to give you several things uh, this morning about Boaz. Look in chapter 2, if you would. 
And you were wondering when we were going to get there, weren't you? Verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. Verse 2, And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was a kindred of Elimelech. Now, that was not her design. She was not some gold digger trying to position herself in the right field. She was there because God put her there. That, and it was hap. That was an ordination of God. That was not some, you know, just woke up and the stars were in my favor day. That was God positioning her exactly where he wanted her. And the problem with a lot of relationships, they get ahead of God and you get the wrong one and start going ahead. And you want, a, you want God's blessing after you're already in fifth gear. How about let's back up at the beginning. And say, oh, God, bring me who you have for me. And because it's a lot easier to get one than get rid of one. And that goes for hiring people. That goes for marriages. That goes for everything. It's a whole lot easier to get one. Amen. Than, than to get rid of one that you figure out, uh-oh. And you ask the question, and I'll get to the message in just a minute. But you ask the question, Pastor, what do you do if you figure out you got the wrong one? Well, if you're married, ask God to give you love for the one you got. If you're not married, run. If you're not married, run. Run far and fast. <laughs> Verse 4, And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Now, from the get-go here, I want to give you some characteristics about Boaz that we need to emulate. First of all, he was simply godly. He was godly. This was not a, a hate-filled landowner. This was not a, a hate-filled businessman. This was a man who loved God, and he wasn't putting on a show. He wasn't putting on a front for some new lady that moved to town. This man was a man that loved God. He operated his business that way. Everybody around him knew that. And by the way, if you're a godly man or a godly woman, you won't have to put up signs, woman of God, man of God. You won't have to put out signs in your yard. You won't have to wear lapel pins. If you're godly, if Jesus Christ has saturated your life and the love of God is flowing out of you, you won't have to put up any signs or you won't have to tweet about it. They'll know it. It's, it it'll, it'll be evident. And so Boaz was, was a godly man and everybody knew it. And he behaved himself in a godly fashion. Even his speech. I mean, he incorporated God's uh, speech. He spoke like a man of God. And gentlemen, let me say to you, there is a speech that ought to accompany God's men. It's not filthy. It's not foul. It's not forward. Amen. It's Christ honoring. There ought to be a certain speech that bereath a man that loves God and lives for God. It ought to just naturally come out of you. And by the way, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. Yes, you did. You might not have meant for it to get from your heart to your mouth, but it was in your heart already. Amen. Oh, it just slipped. No, it didn't just slip. It was there. Boy, getting quiet right here. This, but we don't talk about, you know, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain and uh, not cussing. Well, we, we can land there for a minute if we need to, but... <laughs> You know, it, it, ought to be, it ought to be a man of God ought to have speech that honors the Lord. It, it ought to be natural. He ought not have to work on it. He ought not have to get the Bible out every, every day. Uh, he ought to, but not, not, for, not to pick a word from the Bible to speak. It ought to be in him. He's already been in the Bible. He's already been on his knees. The Spirit of God is leading him. It ought, I'm not saying perfect, 
There are times that are going to come when you're frustrated and things, uh, you know, tempt you to, to say things rashly and out of sorts. I understand that. But for the most part, if you love God, it ought to, it ought to tell on you when you talk. It ought to be a speech uh, that, that identifies you as a man of God. Ecclesiastes 10, 12 says, The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. You ought to be a gracious speaking man. You ought to be a gracious speaking woman. A gracious speaking lady. Where has that term went? You don't even hear people say lady anymore. They don't say the word lady. I mean, you hardly ever even hear the word lady. You'll hear that woman. You hardly ever hear the term lady. And you even rarer than that see one. But God's people ought to behave themselves like men of God and ladies of God. We ought to behave ourselves like that. Now, next we see in verse 8, look at it. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from thence, but abide here fast by my maidens. So she ends up here. And in Boaz's area, and he says to her, you stay, you stay right here. First of all, he says, I, I, want you to, I want you to hear me. I want you to listen to me. Listen closely. Listen carefully, my daughter. He said, I want you to listen. Boaz took the initiative. He took the initiative, and he spoke to her with tender concern. He spoke gently. And, uh, gentlemen, we ought to speak to our wives gently and with concern. They're not animals. They're not less than human. And uh, giving as unto the weaker vessel, where the Bible says weaker vessel, you know what that means? It's like fine china. You handle it. It don't mean subservient. It means handle very delicately. Like you, don't care, you don't throw China from end to end. If you do, you'll be wishing you hadn't. Huh? But you handle it very carefully. And Boaz handled, uh, spoke with, with tender concern. He said, but I do, I do want you to listen to me. And he initiated. He said, I want you to hang out right, right where I tell you. He initiated uh, this process. And uh, she, she just was there. God put her there. But he, he initiated it. And uh, he was the initiator, not the terminator of this relationship. <laughs> and uh, he, he initiated it. Uh, he gives this beautiful portrayal of God reaching down to us. And uh, by the way, if you're here this morning, you're unsaved. I want to say it's God that's looking for you. I'm not climbing up some ladder trying to hold on. <laughs> that song, it, gets, it got in my head one day and I thought, this ain't even right. You ever sing a I mean, Christian song, it ain't, it ain't, the words ain't even right. I'm not trying to hold on to anything. Amen. Because he's holding on to me. If it's up to me, I'd have let go a long time ago. Salvation's not up to me. Boaz was the initiator. He came looking. When I was lost, May the 4th, 1986, as a 14-year-old young man, I knew my life was a mess. I knew I didn't have any hope. I knew that I was, I mean, zero, but I didn't know what to do. And it was him, through the person of the Holy Spirit, that came knocking on my heart's door. It was him that convicted me of my sin and showed me my need of him. He, God, is the initiator. If you're not looking for him no more than a man in the moon. He's looking for us. He sent his son. I mean, there's a great search party from heaven. And if you're here lost, all of heaven is looking for you. I mean, there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. He's looking for you. You may think, well, I'm, I'm missing something. I, I understand all that. But he's looking for you, and he was looking for you before the foundation of the world. Amen. And he is the initiator. And uh, here Boaz shows that as he initiates uh, this conversation and, and says, look, I want you to stay 
uh, right here. He reaches out to us, and it's the amazing grace of God that makes the first move, that made the first move to my aid. As a 14-year-old young man, it was the amazing grace of God displayed on Calvary, brought forth on May the 4th, 1986, actually before the world began, but I found out about it on May the 4th, 1986, about 1215. And so God brought all that together. It is God that makes a change. It is God's grace. You can't turn over a new leaf. You can't climb a little higher. You can't do a little more. It's yielding, falling on your face and saying, Oh, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's not trying better. It's not turning over a new leaf and making a new list. It's saying, Oh, God, have merciful. I think I can do better if I try. I think I can quit it. I think I can stop. You can't stop on your own. It is the power of God that worketh in you. And God must save your soul and change you to do any better. And I'm glad he does. Amen. But he loves you and wants you for himself. Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. I mean, if it wasn't a work of God, why would he give himself? He gave himself so that he could redeem us from our iniquity, so that he could purify unto himself a peculiar people. It is a work of God, and God was the initiator in salvation. 1 Peter 2, 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 John 4, 10, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He took the initiative in salvation when we were spiritually dead, Ephesians 2, 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. I mean, we were without spiritual strength. We were helpless and hopeless. I mean, we were holy, rebellious sinners, according to Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were totally against God and his ways, Christ died for us. God commended, God showed, God sent forth his love to us. Even though we were holy against and rebellious against him, God commended, displayed, showered his love on us. And I'm glad he did. I mean, we were the enemies of God. And by the way, salvation is not an afterthought of God. It was a divine plan of God. And here, we see that Boaz takes the first steps. He's the initiator. And let me say on a, on a human level, gentlemen, uh, you, you don't wait for mama to do everything. And mama, I'm speaking your wife. You, you initiate. How are we supposed to love our wives? Even as Christ loved the church and what? Gave himself. Our example is Jesus giving himself, dying for us. That's our example. And so, gentlemen, you be the initiator. Y'all not have your wife make all your dates for you. And by the way, first thing, get a date. Have a date night. Well, I mean, some of these men, honestly, I, I'm not kidding. It's like this. D A T E. Date. N I G H T. Now you can sign it. Date night. That was D. I missed D. Date night. Y'all to have it. Y'all to, to guard it. Y'all to have it. I talked to somebody in the ministry the other week. He said, I. I got this going on, got that going on, about to lose my wife. I said, you know what I'd lose before her? That ministry you just told me about? I said, forget that for now. 
Amen. Oh, that's terrible. No, no, no. God gave you a wife before he gave you a ministry. Your ministry is your wife. God's first. I'm not saying put family before God. Put God first. But God, his ordained, his order is take care. I said, just forget. Uh Uh-huh. I said, yeah. I said, just call that off. What? I have responsibilities. I said, yeah, you got one main one. It's called your wife. Let's forget the meeting. Call it off. Huh? Yeah. Did you tell him that, Pastor? You better believe I did. I said, just hold off on that. You get this straight. Start dating your wife and then go back and reschedule. But right now, the best thing you can do is secure her. Men, initiate love. You're the initiator. Don't wait on her. You initiate. You're the one getting stuff together for the date night. You're the one that's, that's calling and texting. Don't wait on her to do all the work in the relationship. You initiate it. Well, I, is this like Chinese? <laughs> Am I okay? I mean, I'm really. I'm, I'm, I, I'm thinking I'm not getting. Maybe I did have a concussion a couple weeks ago. I'm thinking if it's just still lingering. You are the initiator. Our pattern is God. Amen. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, you you initiate the love relationship between uh, you and your your spouse. And then number three, he he provides. Look at verse 8. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter, go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast. By my maidens, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go, uh, go on, uh, go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they should not touch thee? And when thou art thirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. He says, I'm going to provide for you. Glean in my fields after the maids. And, and they'd go and they'd cut that. I mean, they'd cut the shocks down, and uh, they'd take that back, and the heavy stuff sometimes would fall. And uh, he, he wanted her to, he knew exactly where she needed to be. He knew where the bad boys were, and uh, he, he provided. He said, go to the water, and they'll get it for you. And uh, a man ought to provide for his wife. Now, ladies, you ought not seek to break him. Amen. Okay. You ought not seek to break him. Don't, and if he's a good man, he's going to work another job to provide for whatever you want. So be careful what you want. Because if he's a good man, he's going to try to get one more job to do what, what it is you need to do. So be careful that what you need to do falls in the category of what God wants you to do. Because you could work him to death trying for him to keep trying to keep up with your tab. I'm not talking about tabs. I'm talking about providing for. Gentlemen, you ought to provide. I just don't know why she needs this and this and this. You should have thought about that before you got married. Your job is to provide. And that means work. I mean, I understand sometimes in our day, you know, the wife may make more than the husband, and that's not a, that's not a downer at all. Amen. You're at least making... You know, a whole bunch keeping them kids. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Amen. Nothing wrong with t- taking care of kids, gentlemen. And you are the father. Amen. The leader of the home. So you can, you can do that. But uh, listen, you are the provider of the family. The, the, when they call wanting bills, it ought not be her they call. It ought to be you. The collectors ought to call you, and then I want to know why they're calling do you need to get it? I just, I just can't, you know, I just, we just ain't making enough money. Well, there's one quick solution. Quit spending as much and get another job. That's two quick things that will stop the bleeding in any financial tumble. Quit spending and get another job. And sometimes we want to quit spending and, and starve our wives out and not get another job. It goes hand in hand. Quit spending as much. If your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall. So stop the spending and get another job. Provide. Boaz said, look, here it is, here it is. 
Women ought not have to fend for themselves. Amen. Even though they can. Gentlemen, you ought to provide for your, for your wife. And again, that doesn't mean a diamond ring every Christmas, ladies. Amen. I know. Mm. Verse 9. What else did he do? He says, have I not charged the young men that they should not touch thee? And that was not a good connotation there. But a, a, a godly man, Boaz here, our picture, he protects. He not only provides, he protects uh, physically. Love beareth all things. He protects her. And uh, you ought to think about protecting her. He said, you, he said, I done told them men if they lay a hand on you, I'm going to knock them out. That's, you know, that's in the Hebrew. <laughs> you know, and if, if they touch you, I've, I've already took care of that. And, uh, you know, you, you gentlemen, if you know your wife's, and that, that's the thing, Walmart at night, you know, up here, the one up here, not the one in Mount Airy, the one in Mount Airy is wonderful. Tell Brother Mike I said that. If you go to the one down here, you need some backup. And, uh, you know, a good husband, just, just being thoughtful, gentlemen, just being thoughtful. Just thoughtful. Just thinking about what, you know if the tires is showing metal or not. Don't send her up the road if you got half a wire sticking out. Well, I didn't know it. Well, who's supposed to know? Wonder if she knew if you was out of gravy or not. Reckon she knew if you was out of flour. I hope she did. Then you ought to know if the wire's sticking out of the tire. Protect. Protect. See ahead things that are, that are going to happen. This was our example, Boaz. And then notice he showed hospitality. And, you know... Here in verse 9, look at it again. And when thou art thirst, go in the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. You ain't even got to pull it up. They pulled it up for you. The letter of law was just to get water. It, I mean, he exceeded the letter of the law. And I'm glad God exceeded the letter of law. He fulfilled the law, and boy, then he showered grace, and I'm glad he did. And you and I as, as men, uh, we, we ought to exceed what's what's. The status quo exceed the law. Yeah, okay, you, you, you got her there. You got her by. How about let's go on a step further. Let's show some love here. It's just duty to do what you're supposed to. Let's go, let's go one step further and show hospitality. And then next in verse 10, Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I'm a stranger? And he bestowed favor on her right here. And that's a whole word study, that word favor and grace there. But he, he, he showed, he bestowed favor. Uh, you ought to favor your spouse more than you favor anybody else, humanly speaking. Amen. That goes for kids and all. God gave you a spouse before he gave you children. And you ought to, you ought to bestow grace and favor you ought to be in her corner. You ought not be against her. You ought to be for her. And then verse 11, what did he do? And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done to thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and art come to a people which thou knowest not heretofore. You know what he did? He praised Ruth. He spoke well of her. He said, I heard about what you did, and I want you to know I noticed it. He said, I know what you did. When was the last time you praised, not patronized your wife? When was the last time you praised her, not just patronized her, to get her off your back? So she'll quit, you know, telling you stuff. I just wish you quit harping at me. Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. Yeah, what, yeah, whatever. Just to get, you know. That's not, that's not real love. A godly man will praise his wife. And as I always say, if you start thinking she's less than par, just remember you married her. Amen. So what does that say about us? You ought to praise her. You ought to praise her. Yeah, and, and I used to do this, and they're not in my house anymore except for Luke. And, and Isaac, he works about 22 hours a day, so I don't see him much. That's no joke, Friday and Saturday, he did. But, um, 
you know, I, when them boys was little, I said, my goodness, looky there. What? I said, look at her. I said, she's beautiful. Oh, don't say that. That's gross, Daddy. Don't say it. No, I'd say, yes, she is. I said, look at that. I said, look at how hard she's working in there. I said, she's beautiful. Y'all do that. It's better than fussing and barking all the time. Just say good things. Oh, I ain't never eaten nothing. That's wonderful. And you, y'all have all lied about food before. You have. <laughs> Try not to lie, but if, if it's good, then it put, it's real good. Amen. And if you ain't never had of it, it never had nothing like that, then you got a big advantage because you can say, man, I ain't never had nothing like this. Praise your wife. And gentlemen, on a, and I know it's 1203, but hang with me. It's wet outside, so you need to stay here till it gets dry. <laughs> it, I, I, on a serious note, every couple I counsel, my, my, most of them, if you don't praise them, if you don't praise your wife, some man will. Now, he shouldn't. He should. And gentlemen, you have no business praising another woman unless and uh, I, I got a rule you know under six or over 60 and uh, if there's some gray-haired saint that got a new hairdo I, I may say uh, miss so-and-so your hair looks very nice today but it's not going to be a 30-year-old woman amen 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 the only woman you got any business saying that's a nice hairdo is your wife unless they're you know up in age you won't try to make their day that's okay amen but praise, if you don't, I promise you somebody already is. Somebody is. You need, to, you need to praise them. And then you need to pray audibly. Look at verse 12. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee, the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. The Lord recompense thy work. So what is he doing right here? He's praying for her. The Lord bless you for what you've done here. He's praying for her. He's praying for her and he's praying with her. We're not time to close yet. Last one. Gentlemen, this is a rough one. Pray out loud with your wife. And we all fall short. All of us do. Amen. Amen. Already do it. Well, you don't do it enough. Well, I don't do it. Let's start. I do it once a month. Let's do it more than that. Pray audibly with your wife. She ought to hear a man pray. She ought to hear her husband pray. Amen. Amen. We're so busy. Well, I don't think that'll hold up to judgment seat. Probably won't hold up. I'm just, you know, I'm more of a private man. Oh, really? Is that why down there at work you tell them how to do everything? Because you're so private? We talk about everything but the things we need to talk about. We ought to pray with them. We ought to pray for them. When was the last time you prayed for your wife? And there's no physical need for you to do so, but you prayed for her anyway. Just to have a good day. And then when's the last time you prayed with her? Out loud. Maybe beside the bed. Not counting supper or lunch. Boaz was a godly example. And gentlemen, can I tell you? You know why the world's shape it's in? Us. You know why relationships are like they are? Because we set the example. You know why men talk so filthy like they do? We got to set the example. We got to set the example. Just because you're rough and it don't, there's no excuse to be carnal and wicked. And for those of you looking for a spouse, make sure you're looking for the right, the right place at the feet of Jesus. That's where you'll find the right one. At the feet of Jesus, you don't even have to look for the right one. God will bring them to you. You know, first time I saw my wife, I was sitting in the cafeteria at Tennessee Temple. 
And I said, there was about seven boys there. And I was sitting there eating lunch. I said, there she is. First time I saw her. I said, who? I said, that's my wife. Huh? You don't even know her. I'm going to. I'm going to get to know her. I said, there she is. And I don't know how long it was. It was a long time after that before I ever talked to her. But God will bring you the right one. God will bring you the right one. And listen, if you got the right one, let her know it. And if you say, Pastor, I don't know if I got the right one, then make it like you do. Because if you're married, you got the one God wants you to have right now. Because God's not the author of divorce. Now, I'm not talking about divorced people. I'm not, you know me. I love you. Things happen. Absolutely. Amen. You can say amen right there. I love you. I'm for divorced people and God's for divorced people. But God's not for divorce. Amen. But you know what? If you're married, make it work. And don't just tolerate each other. Love each other. I'm tired of seeing two couples live in the same house, but they ain't no more married than a man in the moon. Just because you live the same, just because you park in the garage don't make you a car. Just because you're standing in the garage, that don't mean, hey, car. Just because you, you got a marriage license don't mean you got a good marriage. You got to work at it. You got to work at it. And it all points back to how God loved us. And gave himself for us. Father, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for the attention. Lord, thank you for the good crowd. Thank you for the visitors. I pray you'll bless now. Lord, I pray that you'll help us. I pray you'll save those that are lost. Reclaim those that are backslidden. In Jesus' name.